Support for Trifles comes from the BSI Press. Manuscripts, collections of papers by international writers, and books covering a wide range of other Sherlockian topics. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And by listeners like you, who choose to support us on Patreon for as little as $1 a month. Patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the lip was twisted, the soldier was blanched, and the men were dancing, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder about whatever happened to Inspector Gregson? Or Mrs. Hudson's husband? Or of Holmes's early clients? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 328, Weapons in the Canon. Well, hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, are you fully weaponized today? <laughs> yes, I've got my, uh, my Kevlar beanie on, so I'm protected from everything. <laughs> Oh, well, I can see your vest from here. And for those who for those who are fans of The Simpsons, you will appreciate the See My Vest reference. I thought the vest was yet to come. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, if I had my soundboard with me right now, I would completely activate the entire thing. Oh, good, good. Uh, well, uh, yes, this is a very special episode of Trifles because we are recording from different studios or one different studio than usual. I am out in Phoenix while we're doing this so uh, Bert is stepping up as uh, the engineer with two thumbs which should be interesting <laughs> um, so you should be doubly uh, efficient well either way uh, we we will be thumbing our way through this episode and through the uh, references regarding this episode in the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes or so uh, if you would like to refer to the show notes to this episode they are available at ihose.co slash trifles three two eight all lowercase, ihose.co slash trifles328. That'll take you directly to the Sherlock Holmes podcast.com website to this episode. You can find any links that we may happen to mention, as well as the ability to subscribe to us on email so you don't miss an update. Uh, And while you're thinking of subscribing, just make sure you mash that subscribe or follow button wherever you happen to be listening to us. And um, if you happen to toddle over to our website or look through our show notes, you will see a link to Patreon. All of our Patreon supporters are eligible for a monthly drawing where we give away back issues of the Baker Street Journal. And then once a quarter, we have a a drawing where we give away an annual subscription to the BSJ as well. So in order to be eligible for that, you just do need to be a trifle supporter. And you also get to listen to the show without ads, if that's your thing on uh, Patreon. Uh, So, appreciate that, and just give it some thought. Well, we are addressing weaponry in the canon, and Bert, this, I I, I wanted to kind of understand what actually prompted you (laughs) to select this story from your your craven mind. (laughs) Craven. This well, this subject was suggested to us by one of our listeners uh, because you know, thanks to you, we have solicited suggestions, and this propped up from one of our listeners, but I can't remember who. Oh goodness! Well, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to look through my notes and see because we do actually reward our listeners with a random prize from the Trifles Vaults if they do, in fact give us an idea that we use on the air. So I think that's wonderful. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this was a, um, a listener uh, suggestion. And we were, we were a bit um, 
I, I want to. I don't want to say nonplussed by it, but but when it was suggested, we said to ourselves, "Well, surely we've done that." But then, of course, we say to ourselves, "Don't call me Shirley," and go back and look at the records. And actually, we haven't. So what we decided to do was to go to one of the great sources of um, information about the cases of Sherlock Holmes. Data, data, data. Holmes says, I can't make bricks without clay in the copper beaches. Well, of course, we went to the good old index, uh, one of the volumes, the reference volumes we turn to all the time, pages 585 and fi- to 593. So this is turned out to be quite a large entry in the good old index about weapons in the canon. And we thought uh, a good place to start would be, you know, just to talk about that landscape, because we've got this this list um, in front of us, and I thought it was really rather in extraordinary. It starts, it starts, the very first entry, of course, is air gun, and then we have arrows and artillery and bayonet, and it goes all the way down after 276 entries to the very last weapon entry, which is a W entry. It's wooden leg from, <laughs> from sign of four. I don't, what do you make of all of this? I, I was, I thought it was just, well, first of all, you know, our, our uh, attitude about the good old index is one of continued admiration. You know, that, that this sort of data architecture, this data collection would be assembled um, but what do you what do you make of all of this? Looking at the, these all of these entries, well, I I really um, I really have to credit the author, and this is Bill Goodrich, uh, William Goodrich, who wrote this, with um, his his level of uh, completeness and 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 frankly creativity in being able to think of well, what qualifies as the weapon, you know, and I think uh, a wooden leg is a perfect example of that. Uh, you had, um, I think it was in, Inspector uh, uh, Thelney Jones, who was a little trepidatious about going down the stairs in front of Jonathan Small, lest he uh, remove his wooden leg and assault him with it. Um, so, I, I mean, the, 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 the kinds of things, let's, let's think back also to Victorian England. Um, there was a variety of weaponry at hand in those days. I mean, it wasn't all, you know, Ely's number twos. It was, you know, there were pokers and there were riding crops and there were uh, uh, stones and you know, <laughs> sticks and stones, the walking sticks, of course. Um, you you had, um, well, I mean, even Sherlock Holmes walking around the streets of London with a harpoon, for God's sake. I mean, the, the canon with these 270 some odd entries is just ripe with ways to commit harm to people in any variety of manner. Well, that's true. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, you know, you, you tend to think of Victorian England as being very staid and organized, of course, in the streets punctuated by the sounds of horses and handsome cabs and cobblestones without until, well, in Victorian England, without really any of the engine noises that make up modern society. Trains happily chugging through a green landscape. Um, and it's not, you don't get a picture of menace immediately. But there do seem to be, um, you know, particularly in an area in a, at a time when, when, Gentlemen are walking with walking sticks, you know, some of which have been leaded so that their heads can be, the heads of the, the cane, the handles of the canes can be more defensive weapons, I suppose. Um, you know, you don't tend to think of it being a, an environment in which menace is lurking everywhere. But, uh, um, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of ways, ways to do damage to each other. Uh, there really were. And... You know, I, I think back to uh, the very first story when we meet Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Watson in a study in Scarlet. Um, 
we think about what weapons appeared in that particular story. And of course, you go back to the to the Utah themes, the second half of the the novel. You're going to see all kinds of weaponry there. But before we even get there, on page 45 in the Doubleday edition, we find a cudgel, <laughs> which is right in line with uh, what you're talking about in terms of the the leaded walking stick. Mm. Uh, now, I don't know, Bert, maybe you're more of a a cudgel expert than I am. <laughs> Maybe I can maybe I can cudgel you into some commentary on this. Um, what what form and shape would a cudgel take in those days? Ah, uh, boy. Well, that is a, that is a very good question, uh, and it's um, you know one that I haven't thought of. I mean, it's basically a short, thick stick. But why would one be carrying? <laughs> Why would one be carrying it around? I suppose it's it's the kind of thing that a sculptor would have because you know it's not a um, it's not a, it's not just a short thick stick. It would have some sort of distinction between the head and the bottom, and it would have you know some sort of handle like um, substance at one end, and that's the kind of thing that that sculptors and woodcarvers and carpenters would be using to tap against their chisels, you know, to shave and to shape wood. So, um, you know, it would be something that, uh, you know, has that sort of, could have that sort of tool kind of capability. But other than that, um, I suppose if you were, you know, if you were a professional criminal, you would be probably carrying one of those around, um, you know, just to have it handy. But I can't really understand why anyone other than a professional criminal would be carrying it around? <laughs> That's a good question, really. Well, I mean, it, it, it's kind of like a, like a mace. Uh, and I'm not talking about the spray can kind of mace that we know today, but kind of the, the medieval, you know, spiked end, which is a distant relative of the cudgel, I believe. Um, I would imagine a cudgel would be a little less conspicuous than a mace. If you were carrying that around the streets of London yeah. uh, at any given time, but um, it was, um, I, I'm, I'm, and I'm referring to the text in a study in Scarlet. Uh, so Enoch Dreber carried a cudgel with him, a stout oak cudgel. And let's recall what Dreber was in mortal fear of, for very good reason, mm. uh, was being tracked down by Jefferson Hope. And he figured if he had this uh, weapon uh, with him, that he could engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now, I don't know about you, Bert, but I've never really imagined Enoch Dreber as a particularly deft individual with regard to hand-to-hand -hand combat. But um, <laughs> anyone with a cudgel <laughs> could do some serious damage. <laughs> well, you know, the wonderful thing, of course, about the Internet is you can find just about everything. And this put me in mind of single stick. And of course, our friend Charlie Blankstein is, is an expert in things related to single, stick, single sticks. But I found that um, Roland George Allenson Wynne, the fifth Baron of Headley, has described some of these weapons in detail in a treatise called Broadsword and Single Stick. And his book mostly deals with fencing with the broadsword. Uh, and there's another section in there about single stick. But there is something in there about cudgels, and it is any thick stick under two feet long, such as a watchman's staff or a policeman's truncheon, may be fairly called a cudgel. And it is not so long ago that cudgel play formed one of the chief attractions at country fairs in many parts of England. Considering the cudgel is a modern weapon, I'm inclined to advocate its use for prodding an enemy in the pit of the stomach. For, with the extra 18 inches or so of reach which your cudgel gives you, it's likely that you may get your thrust well home before the opponent can hit you with his fist. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, and that's, I think that's pretty similar to a life preserver, uh, you know, yes. which was a similar, similar sort of uh, item. 
I wonder if we can order them on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> you know, friends, get your Sherlock Holmes brand cudgel. Are you in need of beating fans off with a with a, with a stick? Well, we have just the thing. <laughs> For all of your fan beating needs. <laughs> fan beating needs. You know, I would think, particularly today when we're more concerned about making good things to eat and enjoy, that somebody would come up with a way of combining a custard and a gelatin and create a different kind of cudgel that would be a dessert. custard <laughs> filled cudgel. Yeah. We need yeah. to civilize cudgels, I think. Well, why don't we take a civilized break here? <laughs> because clearly we've gone off the rails. And get this quick message from our sponsor. In 2023, the BSI Press has added more titles to its roster that you won't want to miss. First up this year is the latest in the BSI Manuscript Series, a title that takes you, well, maybe a moment to connect to the story, The Haven Horror. If you guess the adventure of the retired colorman, you're more clever than Josiah Amberley. This manuscript, once owned by Dame Jean Conan Doyle and bequeathed to the British Museum, is a very clean one, coming as it did at the conclusion of the canon. But the essays that accompany it are wonderfully informative. Dan Andriaco looks at prostheses in the canon. The BSI's resident toxicologist Marina Stajic brings us into the realm of poisons, and our own Bert Wolder tells about the life of the artist Frank Wiles. These and more are colorful, just as colorful as the original story that acted as a metaphor and reality, and it treats the reader to a kaleidoscope of shades and hues that will provide hours of reading pleasure. Be sure to get your copy of The Haven Horror before it's sold out at BakerStreetIrregulars.com today. All right, we're back talking about weapons in the canon. We kind of got sidetracked there with the cudgel, but I think it was a, a really interesting sidetrack um, because it, it's not often one gets to think about uh, that kind of weapon. Um, what else did you want to cover on, on this extensive list, Bert? Well, we can come back to this again and again, I think, because there's so much here. I mean, you could ask, what does it tell you about the cases and the characters of... Uh, Sherlock Holmes and the kind of people that he comes in contact with. And of course, one of the things you realize when you look at this list is the large uh, percentage in the world of weaponry of Sherlock Holmes that uh, firearms basically play, which is not surprising. But what is um, sort of surprising, and I haven't looked at this, is that um, the number of cases involving firearms, in other words, I see, you know, there are a lot of repetitive entries here. For example, in the cases of Sherlock Holmes that take you into certain times and places, there are uh, more frequent references to rifles and firearms. For example, in The Valley of Fear, for example, in A Study in Scarlet, when we're in the uh, American section of the story. Other than that, you know, the things that tend to repeat are very small references. Holmes will occasionally ask Watson if he has his revolver with him. Occasionally, rarely, Holmes has uh, a firearm. We have, of course, the Jezail bullet, the rifle with which Holmes, uh, Watson was wounded, and things like that. Um isn't that interesting? I just wanted to pause there for a moment because the Valley of Fear and the Study in Scarlet both had flashback sections of the novel, and both of those flashbacks took place in the United States. And each of those stories included uh, quite a bit of firearm play, gunplay in that American section. So we're going back about 150 years and America's gun culture was still leading at the time. I just find that fascinating. Oh, well, you know, it, it, that's part of the challenge about um, figuring out how to reduce threats associated with firearms 
in in a in a 21st century society because the gun culture in America, you know, is very very well established and it goes back hundreds of years, you know, to even before, you know, the founding of the country. Um and it, it really is which, really is a part of life. Uh, but speaking of which, can you name for me without looking the one Sherlock Holmes story where a flintlock pistol was featured? <laughs> no, I, I can't do it without without <laughs> looking because I ap- I happen to have that uh, yes. <laughs> right right in front of my. Uh, okay, uh, give it away. Give it away for everybody. Eyes. It was in the Hound of the Baskervilles. Yes. But I don't remember the reference. I haven't looked to page 674 of the Double Day. I was surprised by it, though. A flintlock in the Hound of the Baskervilles? Oh, well, this is in the Hugo Baskerville section. Let's see. So it was a flashback. Everything was now in an uproar, some calling for their pistols, some for their horses, and some for another flask of wine. So I, I guess it's assumed that it would be a flintlock pistol rather than the flintlock pistol being specifically named oh, as that weapon. Oh, that's clever. Yeah. Yeah. But that's in clever. the flashback. But that's clever of Bill Goodrich, isn't it? Because it would have, yeah, and, would have been a flintlock. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's why I said initially that it took so much creativity and imagination for him to come up with this list. Hmm. Because we are thinking... Uh, beyond uh, simply what's on the printed page, and rather what's inferred in some instances like this. Yeah, I mean, that's a lovely added dimension of definition that he's contributed to this. Uh, (laughs) Well, I suppose, you know, we could end by sort of asking ourselves what, you know, your reaction is to all of this and what insights we get from looking at this array. You know, there's uh, things like a brace of pistols, uh, six shooters are called out, carbines, elephant guns, a hydraulic press is a weapon in the engineer's thumb. Of course, we mentioned the riding whips and the riding crops and everything associated with horses. There's, there's, a, bam, there's a bamboo spear in sign of four. There's walking sticks. I mean, what do you, what do you make of it all? Well, you know, we often talk about the Sherlock Holmes stories in their completeness the canon as it were of of, well first of all being a textbook of friendship but we also call it a microcosm of the world because there's pretty much anything uh that you can think of and and beyond in some cases in the canon and i think with regard to weaponry um it really continues along that same vein that is there is such a wide variety of ways to cause harm to people. And the human imagination, when in desperation, knows no bounds <laughs> in terms of what it will use to snuff out the life or cause harm to another when, uh, when push comes to shove. And I think that uh, Conan Doyle, in his wonderful descriptive prose and his own storytelling imagination has come up with so many different options for us to consider here that weave their ways in and out of these stories that make them just as realistic as we've always thought they were. Mm. Oh, and that's beautiful. That's very well said. Well, the, the thi- what, occurred, what occurred to me uh, about it, I asked myself, you know, what might be missing here? Because this looks so complete. And of course, it depends on your definition of the word weapon. Um, but, but as an instrument of death, one of the things that's missing is in the Musgrave ritual, of course, Brunton is entombed in that secret chamber beneath the yeah. basement at Musgrave Manor. And it's because of a very heavy stone that's dropped on him that he can't, he can't push away. And stone is listed as a weapon, but it's listed as a weapon in Boscombe Valley mystery as something that someone will use to hit someone with. And it occurred to me, um, you know, that, that that particular stone in Musgrave Ritual wasn't, wasn't mentioned. But, but what I realized about that really was, for the first time, how, how much like Edgar Allan Poe, that scene in the Musgrave Ritual was, you know, with someone being uh, suffocated 
down, yeah. down in a basement, you know, his cries unable to be heard in the dark. Uh, it just shows you the, the Edgar Allan Poe influence on, uh, on Conan Doyle again. And, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I mean, Brunton, when you consider it at the end, was really just stoned out of his mind. <laughs> <laughs> and that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. And your revolver. I would be obliged if you would slip it into your pocket. And Ely number two is an excellent argument against gentlemen who can twist steel pokers into knots. That and your toothbrush are, I think, all we need.